sit here last week, Dr. Schnitzel, and with this agonising pain in my yes. tummy, just as though there was a huge imaginary screw in my navel. <laughs> and, and you said I should go home and get an imaginary screwdriver and undo it. <laughs> And the pain would go. Well, I'd done that. I unscrewed it ever so carefully, and the pain did go, but. But. Well, out with it, what happened? My leg fell off. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. No, it's not messing about. <laughs> Welcome all you lovers of the body beautiful. <laughs> yes, it, yes. <laughs> it's time to sit down, tune in, turn on, freak out, ease off. Ease off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the eighth wonder of the world, your own Kenneth Q. Williams. What's the Q for? What? What's the queue for? The Kenneth Williams exhibition lab in the foyer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All my bits and pieces are on display. Yes, out there is the actual bed on which I first saw the light. And, and the little Lord Fauntleroy suit I wore when I was two. To what? <laughs> Too young to know any better. <laughs> Not to mention the teensy weensy plastic raincoat with matching sou'easter. You mean sou'wester? No, I used to wear it sideways. <laughs> yes, it's all out there, dominated by the life size statue of my actual self. Oh, my base hasn't arrived yet, of course. Well, never mind. <laughs> Someday your plinth will come. <laughs> I don't have to stay here to be insulted. I can get that outside. Well, I'm sick of all this Williams mania. The writer's unrolling the red carpet in front of him everywhere he goes. Everywhere? Everywhere. Oh, that a spineless lot. Yes, you're right. Especially that Miles Cook. I think you've mixed them up. They were mixed up before I came along, though. <laughs> what annoys me is the way the producer lays on all sorts of things for that Williams. Oh, so I believe. Yes, liveridge chauffeur to pick him up every day. Mm. He looks a right Charlie, piggyback down Regent Street. I heard that. And why not remember I pull him in? Yes, and we're all grateful for it. And <laughs> the point is, I'm not getting my share. And neither am I. You two, you two should get together. <laughs> I ask for no more than is my due as an exceptionally lovely human being. <laughs> lovely. Can I help it if people adore me? A door? A door? Yes, and I, Dr. Smith, am entering through it. <laughs> just in time to announce something for the connoisseur as we make another cultural pilgrimage to the stately home of the Earl of Shotterley. <laughs> Purges all. I was hoping today to give you a detailed description of one of Lord Elgin's marbles. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, uh, which is housed in the Long Gallery and is a remarkably arresting statue of a discus thrower. But last week, an important bit of him got knocked off. <laughs> At the present, he is ours de combat. And so, so's the parlour maid who was giving him the wash down at the time. I told her his discus was loose. She wouldn't listen. No, I couldn't wait to get started. However, the Long Gallery has several other interesting items, one of which is her ladyship, who I see is dangling from the chandelier. What are you doing up there, Georgina? Come down at once. I can't. The ladder fell down when I was dusting the luster. Oh, well, I dare say Dickens will be along in a minute. You'll just have to hang on. I've been hanging on all morning. <laughs> And in this cold weather, you ought to wear something warmer underneath. <laughs> now, where, yeah, where was I? Oh, oh, yes, yes, through this door here, we come to the king's bedchamber, 
Yes, nice. <laughs> Where Henry VIII spent his wedding night on several occasions. <laughs> Which may account for the four poster bed only being three and a half posts. <laughs> in the glass case in the corner is something of great historical interest the King's Nightcap on which is embroidered the motto, Oni Soir Qui Maille Pons, which means, good night, honey, it won't be as bad as you think. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we descend the main staircase, I'm reminded of the words of the late poet laureate. <laughs> reminded of the words of the late poet Laureate, <laughs> who, who wrote, if you can keep your aid while others talk of this and that, you'll not only be a man, you'll have a place to put your hat. <laughs> And now it's Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother Time. And here once again is Maud Nethersole. Hello, Tinies. And Biggies, too. <laughs> now today is How to Do It Day. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you. We're going to learn how to make an Indian totem pole. To start with, go out and fell a medium-sized tree. Or, if you live in the town, a telegraph pole will do. <laughs> but get rid of all the nasty wires round the top and any post office engineers who happen to be up it at the time. <laughs> now, to decorate your pole, get a nice... <laughs> get a nice sheep's head from the butcher. Boil for about a week. Uh, the sheep's head, not the butcher. <laughs> and you'll have the most delicious sheep soup, which you and your fellow braves can dip into when you're sitting round the campfire, smoking an old moccasin and making heap big wampum. <laughs> no. Put the sheep's head at the top of the pole and underneath do a realistic carving of Sitting Bull or his squaw, Squatting Cow. <laughs> if you want to have a go at running bear, <laughs> wait until the weather gets warm. Your pole is now ready for use. Put it in, put it in the middle of the lawn, stick a feather in your hair, and dance round it waving your little tomahawk and shouting, Ha! <laughs> and perhaps Daddy will tell you the story of Minnie Ha Ha and how she came to be called Laughing Water. <laughs> Next week, I'll tell you how to get a wigwam on the national health. But now... <laughs> but now I think it's time for our song. Two little mice, or it may have been three, lived in a hole in a sycamore tree. Three little mice, or perhaps it was four, possibly even four. Hoped very much not another mouse more would arrive. Five little mice, not so little at that. One in particular got very fat. Sent for the doctor who came round to call. Said it was even odds. It was all due to wind, but it wasn't at all. It was Quads. Nine little mice, and with more on the way. Some intermarried, I'm sorry to say. Dozens of nappies that hung in the breeze. Hardly an inch to spare. Half an hour queue for the bath, if you please. And elsewhere. <laughs> so some went to Hampshire, and some went to Wilts. Some went to Scotland and bought themselves kilts. Till there were only the two little mice waving goodbye, and then they said to each other, How peaceful, how nice, and started all over again. <laughs> Oh, 
And now, a glimpse into the past with the feature we call Vardying Back. Today, we strip off the veils of mystery and intrigue that surround the life of a Secret Service agent. Oh, hello, I'm 006, and this is my undercover friend and opposite number, 600. Oh, hello! Oh, hello! Oh, oh how very ipcress to Vardy a confidential file. <laughs> Well, now, which of you chaps is going to strip off your veil first? Chaps! <laughs> Where? Get Checkpoint Charlie. <laughs> oh, there now, he's penetrated our disguise. Mm. I told you we should have worn thicker veils. It's that gun holster of yours that's the giveaway. What? I, I keep telling you, wear it under your arm. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it round here. <laughs> it's more stylish. Besides, it keeps my secret transmitter warm. You never know when a message is going to come through. Mm, chance to be a fan thing. <laughs> Nobody's been near our hotline for weeks. <laughs> I was only saying to M the other day. M? Yes, our superior at the special branch, M. Short for Emma. Mm. <laughs> very superior, oh, too. Very. Always mm. coming, the madam. Mm. And so rude. Uh, forgive me interrupting, but oh, um, no. I was hoping you'd tell us something about your actual work. Oh, doesn't love, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> dare. Official secrets act, you know. Mm. I mean, all our acts are official secrets. Yeah. <laughs> I can assure you there's no one listening. I can prove it with last week's audience figure. Yeah, are you sure the place isn't bugged? No, we had it sprayed this morning. Oh, that's nice. Mm. <laughs> Thought it was his aftershave. <laughs> tell him, here, I tell you what, tell him what? about how a nameless foreign power nearly breached your securities. <laughs> Confidential. Get it off your conscience. Go on. No, I don't. Get it off your conscience. Well, what? could do with the rest. <laughs> oh, very well. Yeah. Well, look, I had I had this assignation, you see, with an American agent. Mm. Tell him his name. No, Go I, on, no, I can't. Come on. Oh, no. It was Cold Finger Clint. <laughs> Oh, they were, too. <laughs> he was supposed to chat me up outside a certain... <laughs> certain foreign building covered with onion-shaped domes. Mm, like the gents at Brighton. Yeah. Oh, those were the days. Yes, yeah. well, that they? wasn't the only thing onion-shaped, was it? Not by a long time. <laughs> Not when you put that fur coat on. No. Mm. Well, I was so cold, you see. I was wearing my teddy bear otty box as well. <laughs> And concealed about my person, I'd had this roll of microfilm. And tell him where you'd concealed it. Oh, I can't. <laughs> oh, on, I said at the time, that's the first place they're going to look. Yes, you do. Especially when they see the way he was walking. <laughs> no, I... I had it in my fur line boot, you see. Anyway, Clint was working under the code name of Doris. Boris, not Boris! <laughs> Not Doris, you great nana. Here, watch it. Yeah. Well, any road, um, unbeknownst to me, he'd been captured by the other side. They'd been grilling him for hours. Oh. <laughs> any road, I was waiting for Clint at the appointed place. Picture the scene, Ducky. I mean, him standing there in the blinding snow, <laughs> and then this black limousine draws up, a furtive figure gets out, whispers the password. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. <laughs> But little did he know, it wasn't Clint at all. Well, how could I tell under all that fur? And did you give the microfilm to the wrong agent and divulge all our secrets to enemy power whose name I can't mention? Did you? Did you? No, I didn't. Was it because it was too cold to take off your fur line boot? I know no, exactly. Tell no. him! Tell him why you wouldn't take your boot off! No. Tell him why you wouldn't show your legs! Well, my seams weren't straight. <laughs> <laughs> But soft, who is this? <laughs> who is this way out little group I see approaching? 
It's Peter, Paul and Mrs. Nosefoltis. Oh, uh, 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 I've got uh, soul, uh, man. Uh, I've got soul. Yeah, I've got soul too. We all got soul this week. They'd run out of fried place. <laughs> How very distressing. So we're going to sing you a soulful song that we picked up in a little mining town. In the Rhonda Valley. Well, I'm sure your saucepan bark is worse than your bite. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's very clever, some of this stuff. Hang down your head, Di Thomas. You have disgraced our choir. By singing, I'll gather lilacs. In the middle of Andal's Messiah. <laughs> what a disgrace, Di Thomas. A terrible thing to do. And after I'll gather lilacs, you thank Colonel Bogey too. <laughs> You'll have to go, Di Thomas. Better collect your hat. It's not what you sang, Di Thomas. It's because you were singing flat. It's because you were singing flat, flat, flat. Once again, it's time for our film adaptation. This week, our Academy Award losing story of the ugly duckling of show business. Fanny Girl. Shouldn't that be Fanny? You can't win them all. <laughs> this is a story about the glitter, the glamour, the glotter, and the heartache of Broadway. <laughs> Cricklewood Broadway. <laughs> there in a fly blown, run down theatre, a fly blown, run down choreographer is trying out a new routine. Yes, right, girls. Now, while you're dancing, I want you to hold your balloons in front of you. <laughs> That's it. I'll say you, number five, you haven't inflated your balloons enough. Balloons? Yes, but never mind. Off we go. <laughs> Music, maestro, please. On all together, up and down. Oh, love it. Lots of titillation. Kick with the right leg, kick with the left leg. Ah! Not both together, number five. <laughs> Come over here. Oh, goodness, you are so ugly. I can't do anything about that. You could have stayed at home. <laughs> What's your name? Fanny Braces. <laughs> yes, well, you're holding things up, Braces. <laughs> I mean, you're all, you're all right in the big point number. Well, I would be, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially with that nose. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, madam, my madam. Said the old stage doorkeeper, unintentionally perpetrating a palindrome. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> That's all right, don't do it again. No. Madam, there's a gentleman without. I'm not interested. <laughs> He's, he's at the stage door. He said he was in the front stalls last night and was struck by you. Mm, that nose again. <laughs> he sends you these, madam. They're roses. Well, they never fit me, but it's an ass thought. <laughs> I'll go and see him. And so it was that Fanny met her stage door genie. Similar to a stage door Johnny, but with light brown hair. <laughs> Hello, my dear. My name is Nick Molefrenzy, a well-known gambler, bad hat, letter to the trade, and part-time liververse notter. Oh. oh, Nick, you're so suave and elegant. The top hat, the opera cloak, the, the bicycle clips, the plimsolls. <laughs> I'm, uh... Oh, Fanny, there's something between you and I, and it's bigger than both of us. It's my nose, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But what can I do, Nick? Noses like this run in my family. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me, Fanny. Blow it, I say. But Nick wasn't the only one interested in Fanny Braces. The next day at the theatre, she discovered a little card in her dressing room. It was me. <laughs> yes, I am the famous impresario, Florence Zieg Meadow. Oh, I've heard of you. Yes. You've produced your follies up and down Broadway for years. <laughs> yes, I have. Well, why not? 
listen, Fanny, you have a certain something. I've made many stars in my time, so I know it when I see it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can be a star, Fanny. I won't say you're pretty. I won't say you're ugly. You're in between. Pretty ugly. <laughs> I shall put you into my new show. <laughs> Big chance, Nick. Can I pull it off? You must, Fanny. You must. This is the role you've been waiting for. I, Douglas Smith, play the role she's been waiting for. <laughs> I'm brown and crusty and still warm from the baker. <laughs> No stopping in. I've been split and buttered and there's a lot of ham in me. Say that again. I'm quite fresh, as you'll find out if you bite me, and I'm wrapped in a napkin so I won't soil the tablecloth. Mm, you were delicious, Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. There's another one like me in the oven. <laughs> oh, come on. Get off. Hey, get on with it. Fanny's big opening night. Every seat in the house is filled with cognoscenti. So the audience is sitting on the floor. But backstage, Fanny is in a blue funk. Oh, nice. It's Susan. I'm so nervous, Mr. Zieg Meadow. And these costumes, they're so daring. What if I flop? Oh. oh, don't worry, dear. Oh, get out there. Go on. You'll soon have them rolling in the aisles. <laughs> The show was a great success. The next day, the critics used such phrases as... It's outstanding! It knocks your eye out! It swept the gallery off their feet! Yes, they could talk of nothing but Fanny's nose. <laughs> I'm sick of it! I'm going to have it altered by a plastic surgeon! Hence, perhaps, her most famous song. Second-hand nose! <laughs> a second-hand nose! Yeah, thank you, dear, thank you. That's very good. Thank you. <laughs> Let you know she gets worse. She really does. <laughs> but Fanny still wasn't happy. Nick was again indulging his compulsion on the tables. <laughs> You've got to stop it, Nick. <laughs> You're knocking over the cruets. <laughs> Fanny! You see, no use, Fanny. There's only one thing we can do. We must get divorced. But we haven't got married yet. Two things. <laughs> but it was not to be, for at that moment, fate stepped in. Yes, and they were my fate. And size 10 boots. Constable Seamus or Harvard Ashery. <laughs> I've come to arrest you, Nick, for embezzling to pay for your gambling debt. <laughs> And so, Nick went to the Nick, and Fanny sat on her chaise long, alone, alone. Now, part, of course, from the inevitable Stop Messing About it with full orchestra. Fanny's all her hooters, now my neuter, she still looks homely. You'll hear the folks all cry, you're gonna see her. F -N -N -Y, it is uncanny. Ugly, she's so ugly with that thrombosis. It's so upturned to that with every sneeze. She blows a picture head off. Blows her this and that off. Blows a picture head off in the ring. And so, this week's film adaptation screeches to a halt. The sound effect of ripping silk was from Mr. Paddock's private collection. <laughs> it's better in stereo. <laughs> and Kenneth Williams provided the rhubarb for the crowd scene. Yes, well, I've got the green fingers, you see. <laughs> and some wearing those cheap gold rings. <laughs> Be that as it may. Oh. Here's Joan Sims. With a word to those on honeymoon, you've left the radio on. <laughs> That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. 
The script was by Johnny Mortimer and Brian Cook and Miles Rudge. The producer was John Simmons. Peach Blossom, you f- yeah, yeah, you, f- you fill me with an all-consuming passion. I cannot live another moment without those tempting cherry lips. Come with me. You must be mine. All right, my place or yours. Oh, well, if you're going to quibble, let's forget the whole thing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims in... No, it's not messing about. Welcome. First, an announcement. You can get it for 12 and 6 from any local stationer. Yes, yes, you'll have to be quick mind or they'll all run out before you get there. What's he talking about? I don't like to ask. I'm talking about my book, my autobiography. You must have seen it on the bookstores. It traces my entire theatrical life. I started as a small boy, you know. Didn't we all? <laughs> Well, I didn't for a start. <laughs> and here, and here with me, with me, I have your actual proof copy. Yes, or your first pull, as it's known, <laughs> as it's known in the publishing world. Look at this photograph on the cover. That's me in the, on the bearskin rug, kicking my little chubby legs. Uh, absolutely starkers. Oh, how sweet. Yeah, it's taken last week. <laughs> And opening, and opening at chap one. Here we are. See the bold type. Oh yes, who is he? We were in the. <laughs> we were in the Marine Commandos together. <laughs> <laughs> believe me, believe me. This is one of those books that once you pick it up, you can't put it down again. No. No, it's bound in flypaper. <laughs> That's, that's rather a nice touch, isn't it? No, it isn't. Oh. Don't do it again. <laughs> well, please yourself. <laughs> but getting back to my book, for only 12 and 6, you can get yourself an unautographed copy. And they're the rare ones. Uh, yeah. the rare ones. <laughs> I'd like an autographed copy, please. I wonder if you'd mind signing this one. Oh, you've actually bought a yes. copy? Oh, well done, Douglas. I never believed what they said about you. No, <laughs> not with those legs, I said. <laughs> it's not possible. Certainly I'll sign it here to Douglas Smith, one of no, the no, best... No, 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 it's not for me, it's for my mother-in-law. She sent me this ghastly fair isle tie for my birthday and I thought I'd get my own back with this book. No, dirty bastard! I all easy now. I'll kill him out of I think you'd better oh. announce something, Douglas. Yes. For your further delight and delectation, we again visit the home of the Earl of Shotterley, who is waiting to show you another of his family heirlooms. Well, well, welcome to Tal Purgis Hall. It's not generally appreciated that I've got very artistic antecedents. In fact, the room I'm in today was often used by my great aunt, the Countess of Cleavage. For, uh, yes, for her soirees musicales, which was the talk of the county, especially when she had them in the morning. <laughs> uh, hanging on the wall is a rich tapestry said to depict six vestal virgins entertaining some visiting soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, with typical Roman hospitality. <laughs> or, or the 
they may be the Sabine women. In either case, the detail is quite startling. <laughs> to demonstrate the acoustics of this room, I've invited Madame Nesta Dimchurch, L-R-A-M, retired, to, <laughs> to, to pop over on her bike and give us a tune on her cello. But due to an unfortunate accident while changing gear, uh, <laughs> as, uh, uh, pizzicato is not what it was. <laughs> as, uh, neither is her uh, three speed. <laughs> so her place will be taken at very short notice by Dibble, my gardener, who will be accompanied by her ladyship on the piano forte. And now, not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Dibble isn't ready. I was just loosening up. Well, <laughs> well, don't. You'll give him ideas. <laughs> no, no, Dibble. Don't put it under your chin. <laughs> Shove it between your legs, mate. <laughs> Be careful of that spike on the parking. <laughs> My wife has chosen to delight you with her contrapuntal variations on a Shropshire lad. Charming piece. <laughs> Especially the opening movement. <laughs> yes, very lovely. Very lovely. It has, it has overtones of Siegfried in the middle of his idyll. Oh, oh, dear. Now, are you ready, Georgina? Yes, yes. Right, get set, go. You've winged her, Dibble. Well played, sir. Right in the... Which reminds me of the immortal words of Longfellow. I shot an arrow into the air and hit the bullseye fair and square. But with the second, no such luck. I only goosed a sitting duck. <laughs> And now, uh, excuse me, hello, stop messing about 3953. Hello, I am one of the list in millions. A likely story. <laughs> yes, the thing is, I feel that Kenneth Williams is uncalled for. <laughs> well, he is. Oh, good, I'll call for him. <laughs> No accounting for taste, is there? And now, it's Cracker Jack and Audio with Mother Time, so pin back your tiny shell likes, because here's Maud Nethersole. Hello, tinies, and biggies, too. Today, I want to concentrate on the biggies, so that they won't... <laughs> so that they won't feel left out in the cold. Here is a story especially for them. Once upon a time, quite recently, there was a mad scientist who wanted to rule the world. Apart from that, he had no ambition at all. And his wife used to say, Ruling the world is all very well, Geoffrey, but will it pay a living wage? What are the chances of promotion? And Geoffrey tried to make some sort of retort, but he couldn't. So he made a test tube instead and locked himself <laughs> locked himself in the laboratory. <laughs> well, April turned to May, May turned to June, and June turned to Arthur, who was too close for comfort. <laughs> and Geoffrey came out of the laboratory shouting, Eureka! Which means I found it in Greek. <laughs> it in English, said his wife, who by this time had lost her memory and the use of her elbows. <laughs> anyway, what is it? A cure for baldness, said Geoffrey. I painted it on my bald patch and look, a shock of hair. It's certainly a shock said his wife. It's bright purple. Oh, well, he replied. There's a few details to be ironed out, but look at the trouble Beethoven had with penicillin. <laughs> and then, from under a toadstool, for the house was very damp, stepped a little man dressed in green. And he said, Hi, devil, buddy, daddy, buddy, daddy, buddy, buddy. I see. 
said Geoffrey. I am sorry that my experiments have made all the bells drop off your little hat. And that's how Geoffrey won the Nobel Prize. But he never got to rule the world, which reminds me that it's time for a song. <laughs> I met a barefoot shepherd boy, a shepherding his flocks. He promised he would marry me if I'd knit him a pair of socks. <laughs> I knitted several pairs of socks to warm his feet perchance, and also a vest to warm his chest and several pairs of ponds. <laughs> but by this time the shepherd boy, he was already wed. And so I'm afraid the clothes I made were worn by his sheep instead. <laughs> People often wonder who is responsible for the health clubs that are proliferating up and down the country. Well, it's not me. But in this week's edition of Vardying Back, we talk to someone who knows the business backwards. Oh, hello. I'm Rocky Simpson, manager of Simpson's Gym, and this is Jim. Oh, hello. 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 Rejuvenating to Vardy a fine brown frame. That's the piano. I'm oh. over here. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, Miss Sharp, straight out the knife box. <laughs> I must say, you both look in remarkably fine shape. Oh, yes, Ducky. Well, we take good care of our bodies, don't we? Oh, we do indeed. Yes, mm. yes. Well, you never know when they're going to come in handy, do you? <laughs> and what you see before you is a triumph of matter over mind. He had some triumph, especially in his case. Yes. He had no body at all when he started. It's true. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, I made up my mind to devote myself to the pursuit of the body beautiful. And he's been pursuing it ever since. <laughs> I have, it's, it's true, true, I have. Yeah. Talk about the loneliness of the long distance runner. Oh. oh, it's my story to the last. Cycles round the park every morning, often as a, as a dip in the dip. serpentine. Yes, I really must get them brakes fixed. Mm. <laughs> then one day it came to me in a blinding flash, didn't it? Mm. Suddenly in a blinding flash. Why not pass on the secrets of my physical well-being to others? Give everyone a share. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I opened up my little establishment, and since then I have never looked back. <laughs> never. never looked back? No. <laughs> well, hardly ever. <laughs> well, there has been the odd occasion. It must be a very rewarding work. Oh, it is. The price of each charges. <laughs> Mind you, he's had his share of heartbreak, haven't you? Oh, don't tell him. No, go on. Tell him about your secret sorrow. Oh, no, I'd much, I'd much prefer oh, not get it out. to... <laughs> You'll feel better if you give it an airing. Oh, it'll ruin my lunch. Never mind that. Tell him. Go oh, on. Very well. Oh. Well, see, soon after I'd opened my place, this fella drops in for a workout and a massage. Tell him his name. <laughs> Tell him his name. It was Clint, wasn't it? <laughs> it was Clint. Oh, yes, well, he was a weightlifter and window dresser. That's right. <laughs> yes. yes. And see, well, he wanted to enter this physique contest. He had hoping to be Mr Hackney Wick, I think he was. That's right. <laughs> After being Mr Hackney Wick. Yes. He had all the qualifications to biceps on him like half a pound of walnuts. Yes. Oh, phantasmagorical <laughs> duck. Oh, yeah. You should have seen the definition on his lallies. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bulging. Burst. Bursting and bursting. Bursting out all over. Yeah. Burst. Like June. Like June. Yes. Bursting out. Like yes. Mm. Any road up, Clint suggested we might enter the contest together. If. Yes, if. Tell him what the if was. Go <laughs> on. Um, well, if he could avail himself of the facilities of my establishment. Mm, and he did avail himself, didn't he? Oh, he did. Oh, there's no denying it. Dedicated he was. Any road, come the contest. Yeah, come the contest, picture the scenes. Yes. Oh, ducky, all oh, the aficionados of Acne Wick is assembled to witness this contest. Yeah. The wings, the wings. memorial all crammed yes. to bursting yes. with hopeful young homies. Yes. Oh. 
yes, they might. Now, the lights dim. dim. The first two contestants hear their names called... Me and Clint. Tim and Clint. Yes. <laughs> they step into the blinding spotlight. Two magnificent specimens of English manhood. Magnificent. <laughs> there was a gasp of wonderment from the crowd. The band strikes up and then... And then tell him what happened. I can't tell him no, what happened. Go on. <laughs> tell him what you and Clint started doing when the band struck up. <laughs> Tell him what you and Clint started doing. Go on. Tell him. Tell him. Oh, Tell the him exhibition what? tango. Oh. 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 If, if music be the food of love, Play on, give me excess of it. Oh, lovely Douglas. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Sims. And here to prove that nothing succeeds like excess are Peter, Paul, and Mrs. Nurse Poultice. Oh, 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 and the same to you. And what song have you for us this week? Well, it's a bit of traditional folk dating back to the covered wagon days when pioneers were hitting the trail to the west. Uh, Finchley West. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be delightful. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is the story of sweet Molly Brown. Lives near the news agent in Kentish Town. She stuck an advertisement up on his board. Lady gives French lessons lately abroad. With a team and a year and a year and a year. A fella comes round and she says, Hallelujah. The fella says, Well, I don't mind if I do. Ten bob an hour, she says, smiling so nice. And this fella's a blonde, it's cheap at the price. <laughs> a year and a year and a year and a year. His name, it was her. He says, call me Herb. They sat on her couch and she taught him a verb. And one or two phrases she thought he might want. Like fair may la port and la plume de mutton. <laughs> and now Molly spends every evening with Herb. His grammar is flawless, his accent superb. And during each lesson, he offers a prayer that he'll learn how to tell her in French why he's there. <laughs> It's time for our film adaptation. This week, a western. <laughs> Set in Mexico, filmed in Italy, dubbed in Spain, a fistful of denaro. Nasty. <laughs> Our story opens in the small Mexican town of Santo Resguardo Tiranina Jardinero de Pintiparado Jadigonza. <laughs> which is rendered in English as Bogner. <laughs> it is the hour of siesta, and all we can hear is the sound of a Spanish guitarist coming through the window of the cantina. Understood! I am Consuela. My enchiladas are the talk of the town. I think. And I am the barman. I am Pepe. Especially after I've taken my tablets. <laughs> Consuela, look, a stranger is riding into town. I see him, all in black. Black a hat, black a shirt, black a guns, black a bicycle. No, yes, me. I'm the stranger. Everyone calls me the man with no. No what? They won't tell me. <laughs> Yeah, and half rotten. <laughs> Late that night, the stranger lay in his room, listening to the noises of the little Mexican town. Far off, a dog howled. He checked his gun, then sat on the bed, idly spinning the chamber. <laughs> well, it helps to pass the time. 
Suddenly the door opened and there stood Consuela with a rose between her teeth. She spoke. <laughs> what? I said I got a thorn in my tongue. Uh. Listen, stranger. As soon as I saw you riding into the town with a cheroot around your shoulders and a half-smoked poncho hanging from your lips, I thought to myself, we got a right one here. I say. Yes. Oh, stranger, there is something you must know. I am troubled by the gringos. No, I shut the door behind you. A ruthless band of American outlaws. They are led by El Bisto, an ex-German who never wears a shirt. Oh, I've heard of him, the fascist gun in the vest. That's the one. He and his men terrorize this town. They kill the men and rap the women. Rap? Yeah, we thought it was a bit odd too. <laughs> Still, if that's what turns them on, you know. This town yes. has been waiting for a tall, dark stranger. You are tall, you are dark, and you're stranger than most. Yeah, I'll buy that. Isn't there a marshal in town? Well, there was, but he deliberately choked himself to death on a mouthful of boiled beef. <gasps> He committed suicide. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? It's even worse than the fascist gun in the vest. Very well, I would do our cane. Just wait till I strap this on. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, that's better. I never go anywhere without my Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> That night, El Bisto and his men rode into town. An unshaven, ruthless band of evil-looking cutthroats. Come on, men, let's have a drink in the cantina. Would you take luncheon vouchers? <laughs> Yes. Good. First a drink. And be quick about it. I don't want to have to use my six-shooter. I, Douglas Smith, play El Bisto's six-shooter. I'm exceptionally well-balanced and my trigger's been filed down, so the lightest touch sets me off. <laughs> Some people think I'm a smooth bore. And they're right. <laughs> but in fact, the inside of me has been rifled. I have the mother of pearl chasing round my butt, but I'm not interested. <laughs> I, I pull a little to the left, and the way things are going, I may be fired at any minute. Uh, not before time. Let's get me back in. I'm up in my room, preparing for the fight with El Bisto. Now, where's my knife? In between your teeth. Well done, just stand there. Go and fetch him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's that strange smell coming up from the bar? It is the bandit leader, senor. Oh, right. Here I go. It's time for the showdown. <laughs> showdown, you fool, not oh down. <laughs> Honestly, I'll do everything myself. All right, Visto, your end is in sight. No, please don't shoot. I didn't want to be a cruel, heartless, vicious thug. My mother, it was my mother, she wanted it for me. Think of my little ones. I have three of them. Really? Yeah. <laughs> a young boy, a young girl, and my eldest, he is Juan. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> we were so poor, senor. Even as a child, I used to walk around with the seat of my trousers out. The rent was always behind. <laughs> All we had to eat was beans, nothing but beans. Cruel wind was forever blowing through the broken windows. Oh, we were so poor, I couldn't afford to be born until I was three. Ah! Mexican thugs I can stand. Hey, Mac, as I hate. Yes, the bandit was dead. It was time for feasting and celebrations. The villagers toasted the handsome stranger with the drooping zapata. 
There was wine, there were women, and for teetotal celibates, there was a little song. Song, naturally enough, by the trio de la Stop Messing About Eros. Since he shot up his small Mr. Lero To the girl in the town, he's a hero But I think they are wasting their time Hooray! Well, in the Mexican parlance, hacienda are film adaptations. Oh, shame. <laughs> and finally, from bad to verse, a poem from Kenneth Williams. The poor amoeba is unisexual. It's really rather ineffectual. No he's or she's. It seems a crime. I wonder how they pass the time. <laughs> That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Johnny Mortimer and Brian Cook and Miles Rudge. The producer was John Simmons. sleep. I just lie here tossing and turning on this bed, wondering, wondering. Can I do anything? <laughs> Possibly. Relax, dear heart. Mm. Let's, mm. let's snuggle mm. down together. Sleep, mm. my love. Sleep. Mm. Look, mistress, after I close, are you going to buy the bed or not? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. No, stop messing about. Hello and welcome. You're probably wondering why I asked you all to be by your radios today. Well, it's to let you know that I've I finally decided to hold it in the Albert Hall. <laughs> yes, on Sunday next. I must try and get along. Yes, yes. Bring your friends. It'll be a grand rally of all quack members. Quack? 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 Yes, Ducky. <laughs> yes. The Kenneth Williams Admiration Club. And we all have a secret sign so that we can recognise each other in the street. I've seen it. Hey? I've seen it yet, and it's no secret. <laughs> Excuse me while I hand out leaflets to the studio audience. Sunday next, my dad, for the evening. Listen, listen, how many fans has he got? Oh, well, they held the last meeting in a telephone box, so work it out for yourself. <laughs> Apparently, they're demanding that he gets a knighthood for his services to the stage this year. But he hasn't been on the stage this year. Oh, I see what they're getting at. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's it. Uh, I've added him around the audience. After all that talk, I feel a little horse. Little horse? Yes, and I, Douglas Smith, play the rear half. <laughs> Any volunteers for the front? No, I should Coco. <laughs> well, now, the scene changes to somewhere in Clapham or thereabouts. The time is the present or soon after, as we bring you... The passion-packed, heart-throbbing, tear-jerking tale of our star-crossed lovers, Meg and Tone. Where are you, my crystallised rosebud? <laughs> run! Run, run to the arms of your gypsy paramour who stands ready and waiting to rattle the cherries on your hat. <laughs> Hello, 
cheeky. <laughs> and about about time. Well, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, how long have we got? Well, I have to be quick, cos I left me old fella in the bathtub. Ah, <laughs> giving him a soak, are you? Giving him a good soak. He could do with it. Yes, uh, and I don't want his suspicions around. No. He'll create like one o'clock if he gets wind. He gets that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what keeps you two together. Burn your boats, uh, beloved, or uh, we'll run off to Weymouth. Ah, uh, 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 Weymouth, my Auntie Doris does yes. bed and breakfast there. Uh, I can't leave him now. He'll never get out of the bath without me to give him an eve. No. I must stand by him. It's the war what made him what he is today. <laughs> Took sudden by the blitz he was. Yes, I know yes. all about him and his yes. trouble with the blast. Yes. Terrible thing, blast. Yeah. Goes round corners. Went round his. All right. <laughs> now blew him off his bike in the middle of Trisic Mound. Yes, right? blew him clean off. Bru yes. Ruined his centre of gravity. It did, it did. <laughs> oh, you should see it now. I don't mm. want to. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. It's yours I'm interested ah, in. Yes. I want to catch you off oh. balance, my pomegranate. Yeah. Oh, my my little desert idol vice, yes. my flag oh. of all oh. nations. Yes. Never mind all that. I'll have to get back to him in a minute to top him up with art. Oh, well, here we go, then. Here we go. I want you to be my rose, my ah. jewel, my one and only. Well, two pints of pasteurised and a yoghurt. <laughs> After that uh, mishmash of frivolity, we turn to our problem corner. And just coming out of the corner is the man with this week's most interesting problem. My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner. <laughs> and my problem is that uh, I am... I am haunted. By whom? Or should I say what? I haven't finished. <laughs> I have this strange horror of cabinets because my mother was frightened by a tall boy. <laughs> so every time the doorbell rings, I rush blindly upstairs and hide. That's why I'm covered with bruises. I don't quite follow. But I live in a bungalow. <laughs> what a tragic story. Have you done anything about it? Yes. I've purchased a tin hat and disconnected the bell. Well, that ought to solve your problem. Yes, but I've got another one now which is causing me even more grief and suffering. And what's that? Oh, oh, I hardly like to say it out loud. Well, then whisper it. Uh, you're standing on my foot. <laughs> Once again, it's Cracker Jack and Ori with Mother Time. So settle down comfortably on the nearest toadstool, because here comes Maud Nethersole. Hello, tinies, and biggies too. And a special hello to whoever it was that sent me a lovely drawing of his engine. <laughs> <laughs> If you ask me, he's almost a biggie. It's such a... <laughs> it's such a good drawing. Now, here's another story of Mr. Pimble, the friendly postman. When Mr. Pimble came home from work, his wife said, Guess what I've got in the oven? <laughs> and Mr. Pimble sniffed and said, hopefully, An old tweed coat? <laughs> Wrong, said his wife. It's one of those radio recipes, and for the first course, I've made soup out of the aerial. <laughs> but just as they sat down to eat, there came a ring at the door, which surprised them a lot as they hadn't got a doorbell. <laughs> and into the kitchen marched seven dwarfs and an anemic-looking girl who would keep singing. <laughs> about a set of prints that she'd ordered. <laughs> and the biggest dwarf cleared his medium-sized throat and said, <laughs> I see, 
said Mr. Pimble. I'm sorry to hear that you've lost your way and that war has been declared and that it's raining. You'd better stay to supper. <laughs> <laughs> so they did. Good boy, said Mr. Pimble when they left. What am I? said the dwarfs, hailing a passing pumpkin. <laughs> and that night, on the stroke of twelve, the woman next door changed from a gorilla into a fairy prince, which gave her husband a nervous breakdown. Because <laughs> he just got her a lovely bunch of coconuts. <laughs> and now it's time that we had a little song. I gave my love an apple, I gave my love a plum. He said, well, thank you kindly, but I hope there's more to come. <laughs> Singing hey down, deady deady down. I gave my love a grapefruit and then a tangerine. He said they're quite delicious, but that isn't what I mean. <laughs> Singing hey down, deady deady down. I gave my love a melon, I gave my love a pear. He said, you're getting warmer, but I'm afraid you're not quite there. <laughs> Singing hey down, deady deady down. And now my love has left me, he went off in the dark. Cause I gave him a banana and he made a rude remark. <laughs> Singing hey down, Derry, which was quite unnecessary. Singing hey down, Derry, Derry, down. And now, fresh from his triumphal season at Madame Tussauds, it's Douglas Smith with my pull-out supplement. And on page one, next to the advertisement for McWhirter's Snuff, the Snuff for Busy Mothers. Thirteen million housewives think there's nothing like a pinch behind the kitchen sink. <laughs> we find our hints on health. Last Tuesday, I blew three perfect smoke rings. What's the problem? I gave up cigarettes years ago. <laughs> I'm a great believer in the therapeutic qualities of Cinepod tea, and I... And there the letter ends abruptly. <laughs> Increased charges on full teeth and spectacles. I am having to compromise. How? I wear my bifocals in my mouth. <laughs> Next. I am 98 years old and my young wife is expecting. It worries me. I see. Uh, have you by any chance got a young lodger? Yes. I'm afraid that explains it. Not really. She's expecting as well. <laughs> yes, yesterday I swallowed half a crown. And? A packet of fags shot out me ear. <laughs> That's fantastic. You should see the version the producer cut out. <laughs> In this week's edition of Vardaing Back, we welcome our men from the ministry. Um, I beg your pardon. Um, a man from the Ministry of Defence Naval Section who is going to tell us about the men who go down to the sea in ships. Oh, hello. I'm the Rear Admiral in charge of Naval Defence, and this is my old shipmate, Flora. Oh, hello! Very Shenandoah to Valdi, a salty old bosun's whistle. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Oh, get him. Oh, come in the nautical Polari. Mm. And may I say, it's the first time I've met a naval officer called Flora. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, it's not his name, love, it's his job. Of course. Flora, first lord of recreations and amenities. <laughs> <laughs> Real name's Evelyn. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very tax 
relaxing work being a flora. I'll say. Oh, finding things for the lads to do when they come ashore. Oh, they want more than a cup of tea and a sing song of the YMCA. Huh? I can tell you. Yes, they want it at the YW. Yeah. But first pair. We know how they feel, don't we? Oh, we do. Yes. We've got first-hand experience of the actual needs, no, the actual needs of, you see, going that low. Yes. Of course, there's a lot of traditions in the Navy. Oh, many, mm. yes. Like, you always have to run across a quarter deck. Mm. One look at the quartermaster was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember when he had that tattoo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've never seen Royal Britannia written so small. <laughs> He had this. <laughs> no, on the other arm, he had this mermaid giving herself her own perm. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yes, I suppose between you, you've seen quite a lot of action. Oh, you can say that again. Yeah. <laughs> Tell you what happened the first time you went cruising. Oh, go on. No, no. Go on, tell no, me what happened. No, modesty forbid. Go on, brazen oh. it out. Get it out. Go on, it's time it was made public. <laughs> Seems so boastful. There's nothing to be ashamed of, Ducky. You did it for England. I did, yes, I did. That's yes, true, I you did. did. Yes. So tell England what it was you did. Yes. <laughs> Very well, I will. <laughs> go on, bow. We was doing this cruise around the Mediterranean, you see, showing the flag. And in those days, there was plenty who wanted to see it. Yes. <laughs> and then one of these pretty officers... Petty! Petty! <laughs> petty, petty, yeah, petty. You great custard, you. Never could tell the difference. <laughs> you keep on interrupting me. Oh, I'm what do you expect? Oh, I'm sorry. I get flustered. Pardon me for Flumming. Go on. <laughs> no. <laughs> tell her. Well... Mm. One of these petty officers, he kept on picking on me. Yes, he did. He was picking on him. Picking on me all the time. Well, tell him his name. Stop. Tell no, him his no, name. No, I can't. Oh, no. It was Clint. Clint. It yeah. was Clint. Yeah. 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 Petty officer Clint. Yeah. Oh, he was a hard man. Mm. Oh, hard. Got nice hands, though. <laughs> And he rolled up. He details me off to scrub out the stoker's mess. So sure. you rolled up your sleeves, didn't you? Yes, I did, and my bell bottom. And took off your lanyard. Yes. <laughs> and I scoured the place from stem to stern. Then I had a quick dust all round the ditty boxes. And polished all, <laughs> polished all their bobs and bits. Yes. Set the table for tea. Nice clean doilies and folded all the table napkins. <laughs> All like little water lilies. All the napkins like water lilies. lilies Lovely. Yes. Lovely. Enough to gladden the heart of any stoker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then when I was in the galley making the tea, I just got there making the tea, suddenly crunch. 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 Ducky. Yes. They struck an iceberg. An iceberg in the Mediterranean. Well, I said we should have turned left at the Isle of Wight, but would they listen? No, no they didn't want to. And the whole ship starts to keel, keel over. over. Tea leaves everywhere. All over the, place. the water starts creeping up his lallies. Oh, yes, yeah. but does he desert his post? No. no. Suddenly the door bursts open, and it's Clint. It was Clint. Clint. Clint coming to save him. But will he be saved? Will he? No. No, no. I won't. Not by him. No, he won't. Clint pleads Clint with him. Does. Oh no, I've treated you bad, lad. Oh, that's good. He, he, don't, did he yes. say that? That's all. That's <laughs> I'm not treating you bad, lad, but the ship is sinking. I order you to take to the boats. And what was your reply? I'm not going with you, I said. I'm not going. I'm not leaving this galley. And tell him why. I can't. Go on. No. Tell him why you wouldn't no. abandon the ship and leave your galley. Tell him why. Well, I just got this lovely jam sponge in the oven. <laughs> And now let music fill the air and sweet old songs be sung. How beautiful, Douglas. Thank you, Miss Sims. Unfortunately, we don't have any sweet old singers. So here to bridge the gap are Peter Paul and Mrs. Nose Poultice. Oh, Pleased Bella. to meet you. I'm uptight, man, uptight. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope you're not too uptight to sing. Oh, well, he'll be all right when he slackens off his braces. <laughs> Today we bring you a lilting Scottish song from the Highlands. There's the Channel Highlands. <laughs> Splendid. Loosen your jerseys and off we go. I don't know how they think it up. <laughs> On an island up in Scotland, in a tiny button pen, 
lived a person called Macpherson. Quite the nastiest of men. Always cursing was Macpherson, doing things he didn't ought. Tossing cables at the neighbours. And his kilt was far too short. <laughs> kindly drop it, kindly stop it, said the neighbours one and all. But Macpherson seemed to worsen. Shoved a hand. In the hall. So they shot him and they got him as he wandered o'er the prey. If he'd only worn a sporran, he'd have been alive today. <laughs> And so we come to our film adaptation. Yes, and this week, a story of the San Francisco Police Department. Uh, With Hugh Paddock playing the McQueen part. <laughs> we proudly present Pullet. <laughs> That's me, Detective Lieutenant Frank Pullard, FBI. Fat, balding and insecure. <laughs> As the story opens, I'm in my automobile with my girlfriend, Sue. I'm looking for the freeway. Oh, look, Frank. <laughs> oh, look, Frank, your little bleep is flashing. <laughs> what does it mean? Message from headquarters. R-17, what is your position? <laughs> well, I'm sort of sprawled across the front seat with the gear lever jack. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's murder, Lieutenant. You're telling me. <laughs> A man named Big Lou has been killed <laughs> in Mother Brown's downtown bar. Get over there. Mother Brown's downtown bar, five minutes later. Lieutenant Pullett kicked open the door, reached for his police special, and waved it at the assembled company. Okay, you guys, hands up. You, Mother Brown, knees up. <laughs> I understand there's a big Lou in here. Don't go passage in second on the left, but he's dead. Uh-uh, <laughs> so I owe, mister. Yeah? Yeah. I showed my badge to the little guy. He looked impressed. Oh, you're an Ovotini, too. <laughs> okay, give me the facts. Start at the beginning. Well, I come in here, I had a few beers, then I shot a little pool, and then it happened. <laughs> yes, that big... Shut up. That, that big Lou staggered in here with half a dozen hatchets in his head. Did he say anything before he died? Yes, he did. He asked if we had any aspirins. <laughs> uh -huh. This is obviously the work of that evil organization known as the Nafia. <gasps> At this point, I, Douglas Smith, step forward to play the Nafia, a criminal offshoot of the Nafia. There's one man behind me, and that's quite enough as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> A man whose name is on everybody's tongue and sends a chill through them. No, that, that is me, Arturo Isololi. I was the first, I was the one who buried the six hatchets in a big loose ahead. Just a friendly warning. Right now, I'm in my luxury penthouse with a cute tomato on my lap. Well, I'm a messy eater. <laughs> Gee, Arturo, how can you stay so calm when Lieutenant Pullet's on your tail? It ain't easy, but I got something that's never let me down, baby. Yeah. You see this? It ain't no banana. Yes, it is. What? Yes, it is. Oh, you're right. It's a banana. You know what this means? You're just eating your gum. <gasps> okay, Arturo, this is it. So I see. He didn't do it, Copper. He didn't do it. He didn't do it, I tell you. Won't you believe me? He didn't do it. I think he would have done it if you hadn't come in. <laughs> I'm not gonna fix a you, copper. Arturo whipped out a pair of knuckle dusters and sprang forward. Oh, yeah, that's better. I hate dusty knuckles. <laughs> oh, what do you want, a cop? You're coming with me down to the station. Oh, good. We can collect train numbers. <laughs> Police station. Well, Arturo got away through the window. Lieutenant Pullet began the search for him. He searched high, he searched low. Oh, saucy. <laughs> And all the time, he had to protect his one witness. Yeah, Lieutenant, why have you brought me up to this hotel room? It's for your own good. 
Oh, I see. Arturo will try to bump you off before you can put a finger on him. I'm going after him. You keep this door locked and don't open it to anybody. Right. I meant after I've gone out. Suit yourself. Oh, Frank, in your ceaseless fight against crime, you, you don't have time for me anymore. I do too, Sue. 30 seconds every Tuesday. It's not enough. Just a brief snatch. I know, Sue, but I've got to find Arturo. The way I see it, he'll be in the last place I'll think of looking. So I'll look there first and leave the first place I was thinking of looking till the last. But, Frank, if you look in the last place you think of looking in first, it'll be the first place you thought of looking in. Now, she's got a point. In the first place, the last place is this flat. And that's where I am, isn't it? So hands up, cop. I got a gun in your back. Oh, yeah? Yourself, Arturo. I got a gun in your back. Quick change of voice. Oh, yeah, hands up yourself, Sue. I got a gun in your back. Oh, yeah, hands up yourself, miss. I got a gun in your back. And as far as we know, they're all still there. <laughs> and so we leave San Francisco as the show sinks slowly in the ratings. <laughs> and to stop messing about it, bound forward with the theme song of our film San Francisco, USA. My height is just four foot bottom to top. The people, they all say, look at him, he's not much cop. And from the kisses he has took, I've only ever caught one crook. He'd not returned his library book. I'd even then one gone away. That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Johnny Mortimer and Brian Cook and Miles Rutch. The producer was John Simmons. Gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. No, it's not messing about. Hello and welcome. Today is the day I'm going to hand them round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once a year, I make a gesture in public. <laughs> this is it, the Kenneth Williams Awards. Awards? Yes, known in the business as the Golden Row Awards. Shouldn't that be Rose? Yes, it should be, but the fishmonger could only let me have the one. <laughs> Just a minute, what exactly are these awards? A statuette or what? Haven't you seen them? <laughs> oh, you haven't seen them? Stay here. Listen, I've got one in my BBC locker next to the effigy of Douglas Smith, stuck full of pins. <laughs> don't, no, don't go away. Don't go away. Chat among yourselves. You chat. Him and his awards. Last year, I went to the film festival at Cannes and came away with a bronze pot. Yes. Well, sunbathing is good for you. <laughs> hey, up, he's coming. Here we are, here we are. This is it. Here, look. One of the actual awards designed by myself and cast in the very best quality plasticine. What do you think? Well, I can see it's meant to represent something, but... Oh, it's not supposed to be a... No. <laughs> no, I didn't think it 
was. I mean, there's nothing like one, really, is there? No. <laughs> No, it isn't. <laughs> Actually, it's an existentialist object. And on the bottom here, see, it has the motto yeah. Vita brevis ars longa. <laughs> no, that means. No, can I translate that? Not an idea. Well, roughly translate that means life is short, so let's get on with it. <laughs> Good, isn't That's it? That's the best suggestion I've heard today. Oh, shut your mouth! <laughs> Meanwhile, we pick up the threads of our romantic serial, Love is a four-letter word, but who's counting? <laughs> what new heartbreak awaits those star-crossed lovers, Meg and Tone? Oh, speak to me, my old sugar plum. Oh, my sugared almond, my little crispy noodle. Vouchsafe me the melodic tinkle of your tuneful lobsons. Pardon? Say something. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name of that fellow what started the war. Oh, you mean yes. Kaiser Bill. Oh, he's always wore a spike on the top of his hat. He did, to discourage the Zeppelins from landing on the <laughs> No, no, the one after him. After Name him. begins with a H. A H. Oh, him, with a H, yes. Hitler. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. I saw him yesterday on an 88 bus. <laughs> you can't have. A uh, silly old bath bun. Uh, of course, the card is living in Argentina, disguised as a gigolo. Yes, <laughs> uh, having a very thin time of it by all accounts. Hardly a reverse turn left in him. No, no, he ain't. He's living in Clapham. Clapham. That's where he got off. Did you ask him if it was him you thought he was? Of course not. I couldn't remember his name. <laughs> That's why I asked you to meet me here. What? You provocative Jezebel! You shameless red herring! I beg your pardon. Meet me on the seat behind the bus shelter, you said. It's time we got together and did something about it. So it is, it's high time. But about what, you tantalizing old tea cake? About Hitler! He got off the bus without paying. Oh. <laughs> it's time for our problem corner, and here's our very own problem man. My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner. <laughs> um, my problem started when they... when they launched the QE2. Ah, you're one of the designers. I haven't finished. Oh. <laughs> because I have this horrid dread every time she sails. You're one of the crew? No, no, no. No, I have this horrid dread that they'll forget to cast off properly and England will be towed out of the Gulf Stream. <laughs> And we will all freeze to death. But surely someone would notice. Only the people living on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> They'd be left behind, you see. Well, uh, if they all waved and shouted... Ha! Ah, but suppose they're all in bed. Oh, I see, yes. That is why when the QE2 sails, I feel compelled to get into a hot bath until the danger has passed. <laughs> it, it's ruining my marriage. Would you care to enlarge on that? <laughs> well, we haven't got a bath. I have to go to the next house, you see, and sometimes there's someone in it. That's why we've just moved. Very sensible. Yes. We set up home on a gas rig in the North Sea. <laughs> now we've got a new problem. Anything serious? It is a bit. <laughs> We're starving to death. <laughs> you see... You see... Yes? We cook by electricity. <laughs> Oh, 
Once again, it's Cracker Jack and Nori with Mother Time, and here comes everybody's auntie, Maud Nethersole. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies, too. <laughs> How many of you have a special little friend you enjoy playing with? <laughs> you, I'm sure. <laughs> well, today's story is about someone with no friends at all. A little brontosaurus called Mervyn, who lived in the middle of Epping Bog. <laughs> One day, he saw something waving to him from a couple of miles away. So he called out. So he hurried over and gave it a friendly nibble. <laughs> and what do you think he found? It was his own tail, and he burst into tears. <laughs> Suddenly, he looked up and saw a mammoth called Cynthia. She said, My name's Cynthia, and I'm a little girl. How about you? And Mervyn said, Why are they So I see, <laughs> said Cynthia. <laughs> this could be the start of something big. <laughs> It's time for a song, and this one is called Goblin Market Day. Today is Goblin Market Day, and in the forest glade, each goblin small puts up his stall and does a lively trade. And round the fairy cobbler's stall, a most excited buzz. When Fred the Elf says, help yourself, and everybody does. <laughs> oh, buy my elderberry wine, a pixie hiccups gaily. And here comes Sean the leprechaun, a-waving his shillelagh. And when the market day is done, perhaps some friendly gnome will give a smile and chat a while and ask to see you home. <laughs> Time now for my incredible pull-out supplement. And on page one, next to the advertisement for McFife's flannelette chest warmers... Buy one when the wind doth blow, stick it up your jumper for a nice warm glow. <laughs> we find our very own music corner. Last week, I was overcome at the opening of a passage in Fingal's Cave. Congratulations. Next. The other day, something happened and made it impossible for me to continue my career as a bass baritone. <laughs> impossible. Impossible. I can continue. And what was that? My voice broke. I'd love to have heard it before. Next. I cannot play the trumpet voluntary. <laughs> but if I'm forced to, I quite enjoy it. Yes. If music be the food of love, I'll have a Beethoven pastoral symphony sandwich. I would like to hear a record of Sophia Loren playing the cymbals. Certainly, here you are. Ah, Mamma Mia! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Next. There aren't many decent, worthwhile parts available for a tenor these days. That's inflation for you. Next. I wondered if you could recommend a lively piece for the fiddle. No, I could not. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I'm afraid that's all the letters we have time for. I haven't finished. Oh, yes, you have. And now. <laughs> this week, Vardoing Back comes to you by special arrangement with Bunny Small Print Productions Limited, Inc. It's the backstage story of a world-famous conjuring act. Oh, hello. I'm the great Frederini, and this is my friend and assistant, the weenie Frederini. Hello! <laughs> oh, how lovely. Oh, very mysterioso to Varda, your vanishing airline. <laughs> Thank you. It's rather hard to Varda yours under that turban. Oh, only bold. <laughs> No turban, ducky. It's a towel. I've been washing my rye. Yeah. <laughs> We've been trying out this new trick, you see, producing doves from unexpected places. <laughs> and, um, well, we had this little upset, didn't we? Little upset, he yes. said. Little, he says. Well. Come the national anthem. I was a walking omelette, ducky. <laughs> was a walking omelette. And you promised me all them birds was fellas. Yes, well... <laughs> Honestly, we did. I said we should have done it with goldfish. <laughs> and where's the drama in goldfish? Oh, no. <laughs> you want to watch it. <laughs> I can just see two goldfish flying out of my opera hat holding the Union Jack. <laughs> you could have them on a wire, couldn't have you? Have them on a... Have them on a wire? Who's going to work it? <laughs> I mean, I'm busy filling the stage with flags, aren't I? Yes, but you don't fit it with bowls. Oh. Then we could do a sideline in scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, an act like yours must need tremendous teamwork. Oh, yes, love. Oh, yes, <laughs> tremendous team. <laughs> tremendous teamwork. Yes, hand in glove. Oh, you have to be oh. with a speciality like ours. Yeah. Tell him who first gave you the idea. <laughs> Oh, I, I dursn't divulge it. I dursn't. Go on. No, no, don't make me. No, I dursn't. It's been the talk of the magic circle for years, no. that is. Tell him! No! Go on! No. <laughs> oh, very well, then. <laughs> the thought first struck me when I took over at short notice in a knife-throwing act. And tell him the name of the act. No, I can't. Tell him the name! No, I can't, no. Go on! It was the four flashing clints, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Four flashing clints, yes. yes. Four of them, Ducky. <laughs> Four clints all over the stage. Quick as a flash, they were. Oh. And at the close of the act, I had to stand against this board. Padded, of course. Yes, padded yes. board. Yes. Balancing this pineapple on top of my head. Yes, balancing. <laughs> yes. Balancing the pineapple on top of his head. Head. Yes. Chose him because of the flattest edge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the flattest edge. And then while the others was juggling with luminous ping pong balls. That lovely touch. Oh, remember. Yeah. Lovely touch. <laughs> lovely touch. Lovely touch. Oh. Yes. Clint, Clint number four, who was my very special friend, he <laughs> hung from his feet, didn't he, on the trapeze? Yes, worked upside down, he did. Oh, yes. Everything upside down, didn't he? <laughs> his mother was an Australian. <laughs> that was the county, yes. that was the actual yeah. county. The only thing that worried me was the costume they gave me. You see, the act was, I don't know if you know this, but mm. the act was originally called The Three Flashing Clints and Delilah. Delilah? Yes, did you oh, know that? No. Uh, no. <laughs> did make a difference. Anyway, I altered the costume a bit you made to make it fit. I mean, I took a bit in there, put a bit out there, mm. a little bit on, and then come the opening night. Oh, picture well, the scene, Ducky. Uh, he enters pineapple in hand. Oh, and got a great round of applause for his exotic accessories. Yes. You well, <laughs> just, just the green harem trousers and 24 brass bangles. Mm. Nothing Clint, showy. nothing showy. <laughs> then Clint, then Clint number four takes up his position on the trapeze. There's a roll of drums as he takes aim at my friend's pineapple. <laughs> oh, no. The audience hold their breath in horror as he draws back the gleaming blade. Suddenly, a voice rings out. Wait! Wait! Don't do it! Whose voice? Mine. <laughs> I just remembered. Go on, tell him what you just remembered. Oh, I can't. Yes, tell him. Tell him why. Oh. Tell him why it was you wouldn't let him go through with it. So I've forgotten to make up my midriff. <gasps> Now, we get the latest news of the pop scene at All Things Trendy from Peter, Paul and Mrs Nose Poultice. Oh, hi, nice man. to meet you. I do my own thing, man. I do, my own thing. <laughs> do you? Well, yeah. I hope you won't do it here. <laughs> I 
was expecting a song. Well, it's a work song sung by lonely Australian sheep farmers when they're camping out in the bush. <laughs> oh, that's shepherd's bush. Well, splendid. Well, rev up your didgeridoos and let's have it. Yes. <clears throat> Once a jolly gas man named of Arthur Harrison worked for the gas board somewhere in Leeds. Called on a lady, found it most embarrassing. All she had on was a necklace of beads. <laughs> Welcome, says the lady, cos I've been expecting you. Gives him a smile as he takes off his hat. My central eating needs a bit of servicing. Please take a look at me thermostat. <laughs> Arthur gives a cough and inquires where the boiler is. Checks all the burners, the pipes and the lot. Works double quick when the lady comes and says to him Take off your coat if you feel too hot <laughs> Now that jolly gas man name of Arthur Harrison A sadder and much wiser man is he Worked there till midnight, didn't charge for overtime And all that he got was a nice cup of tea <laughs> nice, nice cup of tea, tea, nice cup of tea All that he got was a nice cup of tea, tea. She offered him a donut, but he didn't fancy it. All that he got was a nice cup of tea. And so we come to our film adaptation. This week, a Shakespearean romantic tragedy in association with Franco Zephyr Zodiac, we, <laughs> we proudly present Romeo and Juliet. Our story starts in fair Verona town at stately home of Capulet. No coaches, pay at entrance, half a crown. <laughs> I am Hubert Capulet. Known as Hub Cap, for short. <laughs> At the moment, I am speaking to my only child. Why is it that you aren't like other boys, eh? Out playing raga and so forth. Because I'm a girl. <laughs> oh, Daddy, I'm no longer a child. I'm a woman, full grown. Can you not see? Oh, yes, I can now, compliment. <laughs> need what other women need. Oh, I'd all better buy one, then. <laughs> I mean a husband. Oh, very well, Juliet. You shall meet the eligible men of Verona. This very night, I shall throw a ball. <laughs> Another household in Verona speaks Montague, a miserable old moaner. Hey, Romeo, lad, you're my only son. When are you going to make me a grandfather, eh? It's time you pull your socks up. Mm. Is that how it's done? <laughs> you, you've no idea, have you, you gum? Just look at you. <laughs> Even your doublet's made out of two old singlets. And that... <laughs> that rough round your neck. Who is he? <laughs> Just an old boyhood friend. <laughs> anyway, it's time to lay aside your stick and hoop and your marbles, son. I mean, you're going on 33. <laughs> Only round the waist, <laughs> and I'll keep taking the tablets. Well, it's time you learnt about girls. Girls? Yes, girl. You must have seen them. They go in and out <laughs> in places where we men don't. Oh, you mean like the powder room? <laughs> well, yes, but look, son. Do you not want the name of Duca to Tesora, Familia Grande, Patroni de Verona de Montico to go on any longer? No, I think it goes on long enough. <laughs> Will Romeo and Juliet now meet? Yes, at the ball that night. By Jove, that's neat. <laughs> 
picture the scene, a touch of fingertips. What flowery prose will fall from their young lips? Are you dancing? Are you asking? I'm asking. I'm dancing. <laughs> I'm a Capulet. I'm Romeo. I dare not tell you what I am. <laughs> not... not a Montague. <gasps> oh, a member of that family with whom my family has had a bitter feud that is handed down from generation to generation and whose name may never be spoken in our household without a curse. Yes. Pleased to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> but tell me, fair Romeo, what do you mean to do? Come into this house with your cutlass at your side. Rapier. Oh, well, if you say so. <laughs> oh. oh, Julia, I cannot resist you with your flaxen yellow lips and your hair like ripe cherries. <laughs> I like funny-looking girls. Oh, but Romeo, our love can never be. Our fathers will stand between us. Yes, that could make things a bit awkward. <laughs> Never mind, love will find a way. Tis night, and on her balcony stands Juliet. Her heart, it burns. But chance from radishes, she's newly eight. <laughs> Something I must tell thee. What, sweet Romeo? <laughs> what I was going to say was that balcony ain't safe. I say, that's not fair. I was going to play the balcony. All week I've been practising sticking out of the house. <laughs> I've had ivy climbing all over me. I was looking forward to a spectacular scene where Mr. Williams climbs up me. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Well, you can play the chorus instead. Off you go. Oh, very well. We see not what the lovers did, lest some of you should blab it. We now meet Friar Lawrence with his coarse and homespun habit. Well, <laughs> helps to keep me awake, you know. That's me, Friar Lawrence. I've been a monk for a very long time. Now, what would you two young gentlemen have me do? <laughs> two young gentlemen, you have been a monk for a very long time. <laughs> oh, Friar... Wish you to marry us. But would we all be happy together? <laughs> no, 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 marry us to each other. <laughs> we wish you to sanctify our union. There's the transport and general work. <laughs> and marry us as well. Oh, right. Do you all, Romeo Montague? I do. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Nevertheless, I pronounce you man and wife. <laughs> And so the Starker's lovers. Starcross, you fool! <laughs> oh, I don't know, though. Exactly. In secret, they were wed, and Romeo quoth his famous words. Come on, girl, time for bed. <laughs> oh, Romeo, I can hardly believe that we're married. Actually, married. I can hardly believe it. I can't. I can't believe it. You just wait till I get these boots off. You'll believe it. We draw a veil across that night, lest decency we flout. There was another page, but the producer cut it out. Nurse, <laughs> yes, I bring news at the door. Oh, I, I'm the town crier. Boo-hoo. News, news of the great struggle between Tybalt and Mercutio. Tybalt to Mercutio nil and relegated to the second division. News, <laughs> news. Yes, yes. Wait, wait, you just can't leave us like that. You was like that when I come in. <laughs> no, she means... She means... She means... What other news, crier? Ha! Ha, 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 ha. It's different. Romeo has been exiled to Mantua. Ooh. Meanwhile, Capulet, not knowing of your secret wedding to Juliet, has promised her hand to Count Paris. <gasps> now, read on. Oh, Friar Lawrence, it would not be right for me to wed Count Paris. I would love another. Certainly. Say when. <laughs> Drink this potion, Juliet. You'll fall into a deep coma before the wedding. You mean I'll be out for the count? 
draft. Exactly. <laughs> she quaffed the draft and floorwards gently slipped. They thought her dead and stuffed her in the crypt. <laughs> Thence came young Romeo with deep regret. And crept into the crypt of Capulet. <laughs> oh, Juliet, I cannot live without you. I shall take this phial of poison and swallow it. So, ah, uh, uh, true apothecary, thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I shall die. I shall die. I shall die till I die, 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 die. <laughs> Do you mind? I am finished. But you can't have an unhappy ending like that. Oh, all right. Get up, Joan. Get up off the tomb. Give it a kick of life, you. Right. You ready? Ready. Ready? All right, then. <clears throat> we both lived happy ever after in Verona town. Twenty-seven kids to make the neighbours frown. And as we dance off sideways with a smile and a wave, Shakespeare's turning in his grave. Or is it bacon? Shakespeare's turning in his grave. Hi! So ends this week's film adaptation. Uh, we understand that some listeners in the Wembley area suffered from interference during the programme. <laughs> but then that's Wembley for you. That was Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Johnny Mortimer and Brian Cook and Miles Rudge. The producer was John Simmons. <laughs>